<clears throat> Hi everyone, this is Dr. Heather Austin Robillard again, and this lecture video is going to be an introduction to risk assessment. As mentioned in previous lectures, we will go over the tasks, knowledge, and skills that could be found on the ICRC exam for if you want to become a licensed chemical dependency counselor. In this lecture video, we are going to talk about appropriate screening and assessment tools, screening and identification of issues outside the scope of our practice, and requiring referrals collaborating with multidisciplinarian teams to determine the course of action as it relates to the client's risk, and then treatment options and detoxification. So let's talk about the why. Why should we care about risk assessment as a licensed chemical dependency counselor? Well, if we go back to our ethics lecture that we did in the, one of the previous modules, it talks about the importance of our um, license is to do no harm with our clients. So part of assessing for risk helps us make sure that we're doing the least amount of harm to our client. Risk assessment can also impact the placement for treatment options. Um, so they may need a specific level of care after we've gone through their risk assessment, um, where it would actually be doing them harm if we gave them a lower level of care. Risk assessment also impacts their treatment outcomes. Um, for example, if they needed a higher level of care, but we gave them a lower higher level of care, even though their risk assessment showed that they needed something higher, uh, they will have probably eventually fail out of that lower risk, uh, lower level of care and need a higher level of care anyways. So this is just a review of those core moral principles for mental health professionals that we discussed in the previous modules. Um, justice, being fair and equitable, beneficence, advocating for our client and the public's well-being, non-malfeasance, doing no harm, autonomy, freedom of choice, um, and fidelity and veracity, being truthful and honoring our commitment. All of these can be important when we are developing our substance abuse evaluation, especially when it comes to risk assessment because we want to make sure we're attending to these ethical principles. Now let's go back to the ASAM um, six dimensions of multidimensional assessment. Um, the first two dimensions are where we're going to be focusing on the risks, specifically as it relates to withdrawal risks, um, possible violent behaviors when it comes to intoxication, or any medical complications that could impact their treatment. So dimension one and dimension two are what we're going to be focusing on for this lecture, and then in the next lecture we'll be focusing more on dimension three. So going along with why should you care about the ASAM continuum of care, uh, remember that the higher level of care would be level four, the intensive inpatient or possibly hospitalization, whereas the, the earliest level would be kind of outpatient or prevention and early um, intervention. So some of the risk assessments we will be talking about will actually kind of pinpoint which continuum of care would be appropriate based off of their risk assessment. So in these next couple slides, we're going to primarily focus on specific assessments for the withdrawal symptoms that require medical assistance. There are some important caveats when it comes to withdrawal assessment. You do need to do some in-depth um, additional training on handling this. Um, because one session with a client may not be enough. Always making sure that you're consulting with your supervisor. Um, because as a licensed chemical dependency counselor intern, you're probably not yet equipped to do this independently until you're fully licensed. Um, it's best practice to be working with a medical group, uh, just in case there is some medical intervention required. Because remember, as a licensed chemical dependency counselor, you're likely not going to be a nurse as well or a doctor. Uh, so this would be out, out of the scope of your practice. And so remember, for this part, you're only going to be screening them um, to be aware of the measures. So when do you need to raise those red flags for possible referral to medical um, intervention? And then just be aware that we won't be able to talk about everything in this slide, so you might want to do some additional readings um, to get some more comprehensive ideas about withdrawal assessment. Again, this is review. You've seen this, doc, uh, this diagram before, but this is kind of the stages that withdrawal goes through. 
Um, the physical withdrawal symptoms typically are seen within 72 hours up to a week or possibly even two weeks. Um, and this is kind of the dangerous area. So you'll see the kind of hill that it's going through. You want to make sure that this is where we're referring for lessons on risk. Psychological withdrawals um, can have a psychological impact on treatment, and we'll be talking about those in the next slides. In the next slide. So remember that depressants uh, typically have some dangerous withdrawal symptoms, which we talked about in one of the previous lecture slides. From your readings, you saw that in the SAMHSA tip number 45, um, it focuses on detoxification. So detoxification is a set of interventions uh, specifically aimed at managing those acute intoxication and withdrawal symptoms. Um, so it is kind of treatment, but it's not the full part of treatment. It helps minimize the harm to the client and manages individual um, acute withdrawal symptoms. And then stabilization is the medical and psychosocial process of assisting a patient through acute intoxication and withdrawal um, and making sure that they're me medically stable and fully supported um, and basically substance free before they move on to the next stage of their treatment. So it's important to know as a licensed chemical dependency counselor, what are the drugs that you're likely going to need to be detoxed um, or that experience severe withdrawal symptoms? The first one is alcohol actually experiences some really dangerous withdrawal symptoms as well as other opiates and benzodiazepines. Um, cannabis can experience some withdrawal symptoms as well as amphetamines. There are particular issues when it comes to synthetic cannabis and MDMA because those are artificial. And then issues with hallucinations, um, intoxications, and aggressive behaviors. <clears throat> so um, what we're looking for is the alcohol withdrawal syndrome or AWS. This is caused by an abrupt discontinuance of alcohol. Uh, so this is anywhere between six and 96 hours after the last drink. Uh, minor symptoms are usually kind of like uh, headache, shaky, kind of hangover stuff, and then they can lead to alcoholic in hallucinations in the day or two after, withdrawal seizures in days, or, days two or three after, and uh, the particularly dangerous one, which would require med medical emergency, would the, be the del delirium tremors within three to four days. And then the life-threatening complications include um, seizures, coma, and even dying from these withdrawal symptoms. The alcohol-related seizures um, of the withdrawal process typically will be current in detoxification and prior seizures are risk factors. They will typically occur within 24 to 48 hours after the abstinence or decreased intake of alcohol and often occur prior to the autonomic hyperactivity generalized a single or few over a short time can happen. So you can see this ASAM multidimensional um, assessment um, in the example for the LA County assessment tool. So for example, they asked the question, did you get physically ill when you stopped using alcohol or drugs? Um, and then the uh, after the client answers those specific questions, the therapist or the evaluator actually gives a severity rating for dimension one. For example, okay, they need intoxication or they have low risk of intoxication. This will again help us identify what is the best um, referral for treatment based on their risks assessments. And through the LA County, you would add up all the risk questions and severity ratings that you did and that kind of gives us what a SAM level they would want. So for example, if they answered the first question as zero or one, it kind of gives you a chart to go through. Now, of course, there might be some clinical um, judgment to determine, like let's say it lands in the middle between high intensity residential um, and clinically managed low intensity residential. You would kind of determine based on clinical judgment what would be the best course of action to take there. There's also an ASAM level of care for determination guidelines with withdrawal management. So again, this is looking at what are their symptoms for withdrawal and what would be the best uh, course of withdrawal management. So do they need outpatient? Do they need residential? Do they need hospitalization? 
One assessment is called the Clinical Institute Withdrawal Assessment for Alcohol. This scale assesses the 10 domains um, like nausea, vomiting, anxiety, sweating, tactile disturbances, etc. It assigns a score of 0 to 7 for each item except for the last item which is 0 to 4. Um, so they can earn a total of about 67. The scale has been validated as a measure to assess the severity of alcohol withdrawal. The higher scores that they get indicate higher risk for complications. Um, so patients receiving scores of eight or more should probably be treated for their withdrawal symptoms. Eight to 10 is minimal to mild withdrawal, eight to 15 is moderate, 15 to severe is impending for delirium tremors. Uh, briefly, just so you know, these are some of the pharmacological therapies for alcohol withdrawal. So the treatment phases um, for alcohol withdrawal, they would use so the treatment phases for alcohol withdrawal that they would use might be benzodiazepines um, to decrease those hyperautomatic states um, or possibly put them into sedation. Other ones could be beta blockers, um, alpha agonists, anti-epileptics um, to kind of help with those withdrawal symptoms. Another assessment tool that we have is the Clinical Opiate Withdrawal Scale, um, or the COWS. Uh, this is not a self-report, it's administered and scored with training. Then there's the SOWS, the Subjective Opiate Withdrawal Scale. Um, so this is a self-report and they, it can kind of give you an idea about mild or moderate or severe withdrawal from their opiates. Lastly, we're going to talk about the assessment for other medical issues that might come up in your substance abuse evaluation. Again, this is going to still be part of Dimension 2, but a little bit into Dimension 3 um, for the ACM multidimensional criteria. Generally speaking, outside the scope of your expertise is usually performed by the medical team but it may still be okay for you to ask some specific questions for just documentation or to red flag for potential risk. Um, this can be evaluated at the intake form. Um, some sample questions are also from that ASAM, the LA County ASAM assessment tool. For example, do they have any specific medical conditions like diabetes, heart problems, thyroid issues? All of those things might be beneficial for you to note. And then with those questions, you as the evaluator would rate the severity rating for Dimension 2. Um, again, it's generally outside of the scope of your practice and usually performed by the medical team, but you would likely be coordinating with This them. is the end of this lecture slide. Please head over to the second lecture slide for this module to learn more about some of the emotional um, and psychological risk assessments that we, you would be doing as a licensed chemical dependency counselor.